manual. It's not yet complete, but it is complete and we'll copy all the folks that need to have copies. There's plenty of need. Thank you. Okay. I ran into the office yesterday and made a copy of what we have so far, some of which is not even yet typed. But I brought it just so I would have notes or use it as a, as a reference, a ready reference for me to present this. Everything that's in here, or most everything that's in here, is certainly in the book, plus some. <clears throat> I always start these things off by assuming that everyone's read the book. It's obviously a wrong assumption. Is that the pocket version? Or? Uh, this, is, this is volume one of nine. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, the, the, the book contains a lot of drawings, which certainly um, people may need as they're troubleshooting things down the road. It also contains a lot of literature on the components that make up this system. The, the purpose of this is to familiarize the people with the general uh, description of this equipment. And I want to just run through it very quickly. Chapter one is safety. And I'm not going to read all these words, but we all recognize the need for safety. And I think one of the comments we make in here, and I'm sure you're several of the comments you guys are well aware of, you know, safety first, keep alert at all times. And, um, you know, your safety is your responsibility and things of that nature. It talks about wearing hard hats and dust masks and uh, safety shoes and so on. The next is an introduction, which is a broad description of the purpose of this equipment. And again, I'm not going to read all the words, uh, but it's obviously there to ventilate the um, dust being generated off of the uh, hook battery 7 and 8. <clears throat> the, the equipment is sized for 450,000 actual cubic feet per minute of gas. And the range of temperature is from 70 degrees to 250 degrees. Now it's probably going to get colder under that shed in the winter time, but that's, that's the design parameters uh, for this equipment, for our equipment. Now, the equipment the Willibrator supplied is from the inlet of the bag house, just over the uh, control room building, to the stack. From the inlet of the bag house, back to ductwork and up to the, to the shed itself was not part of our supply. So, I, I know a little bit about it, but I don't know all the details about it. The bag house consists of eight modules, and <clears throat> with all of those modules in operation, the air to cloth ratio, or the gas to cloth ratio, is 5.17 CFM to one square foot of cloth. When you take one of them offline to clean it, if we go to offline cleaning, or if you take one offline for maintenance, the ratio then goes to 5.90 to 1. So, looking at a little better than 5 to 1, almost 6 to 1, um, the, the interesting thing there, or the significance there, is that the lower the ratio, the better the damn thing will operate. If there were 16 modules sitting out there and the ratio were cut in half, it would run better than it's going to run with 8. But 16 costs more money than 8. So you have to look, you know, you draw an economic line somewhere based on experience, and you pick a ratio, and you go with the, with the ratio, which then gets reflected in the economics. The, each module, again, of which there are eight, is designated as a size 3315. And what that means is there are 33 rows of bags each row has 15 bags in it. It's also known as a model 168, which is the length of the bag, 168 inches, 14 feet. And it's also referred to as a series 6P. 6 means it's 6 inches in diameter. P means it's clean by pulsing. This is the Willibrator nomenclature for this particular module. With 15 bags in each of the 33 rows, that makes a total of 495 bags in each module. Times 8 gets you up to um, about 4,000 bags, just under 4,000 bags. Um, 
And again, by the fact that they're 168 inches long and 6 inches in diameter, you can certainly sit down and calculate the square feet. And knowing the, the, the volume of 450,000, you can calculate the ratio, which we just talked about. The <clears throat> rest of this describes what we supplied, the housing, and the fact that there are doors in the housing, hopper doors, module doors, there's a diffuser plate on the inside, there's a, an inlet stub and, a, and an outlet stub. <clears throat> There's a hopper, the slope of the hopper, and uh, the, the, uh, what material construction is, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, and we'll get, we can get into all those items as, uh, as we proceed through this. But I wanted to get back to another section here that um, did I find it? Okay. Is the, is the description of the operation of this equipment. The first part is a description of the equipment. This part is a description of the operation. And I think that's really the area that folks are more interested in. Again, the modules consist of uh, eight and are seal welded and gasketed for airtight construction. The thing operates, of course, under a negative pressure uh, as induced by the fans. Uh, there's a door at the tube sheet level, there's a door at the hopper level. Um, the module is divided into two sections. There's the clean side, which is a walk-in side, referred to as a walk-in plenum, and the, the dirty side, which is the, the housing for the bags and the hopper. Um, what separates these two is the, is the tube sheet. The design of the tube sheet allows a no-tool bag attachment. And I don't know if uh, any of you had a chance to see how those bags went in, but you put the bag down in the hole, snap it into the hole, put the cage and the venturi down inside the bag, the venturi snaps into the cage, the cage has a, the venturi has a flange on it, the flange sits on the tube sheet. It's all suspended from the tube sheet. Uh, if we get the opportunity, we'll open up a door, go in and remove one of those and show you how it's done. Um, the hopper under each compartment is there for the purpose of collecting the material and the material comes out in, in two, um, under two conditions. First, just natural fallout. As the gas enters the, the bag house, the way the bag house is constructed, there's a target plate, the gas comes in, hits the target, and must go down and go underneath it and get up to the bag side. And with that change in direction and the change in velocity, it, all the heavy material, or a lot of the heavy material is going to drop out into the hopper just by gravity. By gas you mean air, right? It's, it's yeah. In our case. Yeah. Air, gas, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the second way, of course, is when you clean the bags, you dislodge the material that's been collected on the bags, and that ends up down in the hopper. We recommend, as an equipment supplier, that the dust removal system, which is at the bottom of the hopper, a hopper screw conveyor discharging into a rotary valve, which discharges into a gather screw conveyor, um, one on the uh, east side, one on the west side, each taking four modules that all of that equipment run continuously. The reason is that if you let it build up, it could certainly bridge. Um, certainly if it gets wet and it freezes, it will bridge. And then you're in there digging it out. And that's not fun at all. So we recommend, and it's, I think it's smart practice, to, to run that equipment continuously and let that material um, be fed through the system into the hopper, and I actually like to refer to the hopper as a funnel, out of the funnel into the conveying system and into where it's being collected. In this particular case, the bottom of the hoppers are insulated with um, insulation and lagging, and underneath the insulation, there are heaters, hopper heaters. Those things have all been set up. There's a hopper heater control panel uh, it's got gauge, a gauge on it that indicates whether you have current flowing. Um, there's also a thermostat that controls the operation of those heaters. And the name of the game is to turn it on and just let it be there 
and it'll cycle on and off uh, based on that set point uh, as required. Purpose of a hopper heater is at the bottom of the hopper is to keep that material warm and free flowing and uh, giving it a chance to get down into the screw conveyor and out of the system. What temperature do you want set points at? I have, you want that above ambient temperature. You want that to be somewhat elevated, right? Yes, I, I believe I, degrees? I think it is 200 degrees. To be honest with you, I thought I had that in here somewhere, and I probably do. <coughs> Typically, hopper heaters are put on hoppers for the, the sole purpose of driving the moisture off before you start up. These are for bag houses that operate at elevated temperatures, coal fired boiler or something like that. Um, so you, you preheat the skin so that when you do collect the material, it doesn't stick to that skin. All right? This is a little different. Uh, we, we certainly want to do that. But we also want to um, try to dry out anything that, that does get over there that's wet. Now, if it's super wet, it isn't going to dry it out. It just isn't going to do the job at, at 200 degrees mounted on the outside of the skin. You're just going to lose too much of that heat before you do any good if it's totally saturated. Will it be? I don't know. Chances are probably good that it will. When we, when we capture a lot of steam, it's probably, as we talked a little bit last week, it's probably going to end up coming over there and the bottom couple feet of the hopper is going to be soaking wet. My guess. I've seen that before. I would guess that's what's going to happen here. Has that happened before with insulated heated hoppers? No. Okay. It's happened before with uninsulated, unheated hoppers. So steps have been taken here to try to uh, either minimize it, circumvent it, um, and, and to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I think we set those thermostats at 200 degrees. It is adjustable. We can make it, um, I don't know the low range of that thermostat. I want to say 80. Um, I believe the high range is 300, so we can make it anything we want, uh, depending upon what we see in the way of operation. If, um, you know, there's two schools of thought. One is if you set the thing at 200 or 300 degrees, it's on all the time consuming energy. The other is you set it down low and uh, it's not on very often, you save money, but maybe it's not doing the kind of job that you want it to do, you need it to do. So we may have to zero in on a good setting, which certainly will change when the weather changes. So when we get around January and it does get cold, but once it leaves the hopper and gets into the screw system, have you had any trouble with the blocking up in there? Not not me personally. I'm sure people have had trouble. Um, but once it gets into the screw, I think you're in pretty good shape. Because with the fact that it's a screw, an auger, it's going to churn it up and, uh, and move it. I've seen um, chunks of material get down into a hopper and get broken up by the screw. So we would, we would kind of hope that uh, if we had a, a chunk the size of a basketball or a baseball or softball or whatever, that it would get chewed up, or it'd be carried along. Now, the problem is when it gets carried along and it gets dumped in the rotary valve, it's gonna jam up the rotary valve. It could. I've seen a welding rod jam up a rotary valve. So, yes, there, there, there certainly could be problems. Um, my crystal ball is in Pittsburgh, so I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> the, um, the hoppers, in this particular case, have two vibrators. Um, these vibrators are manually operated by a push-button station located near the hopper on a column. And the purpose of the vibrators is to act as a, a, a 
an aid to get you out of any trouble that those may develop. The vibrators do not cycle automatically. They're strictly a manual operation. Uh, one on each side of the hopper near the discharge of the uh, hopper screw. These hoppers are not uh, pyramidal. They're trough hoppers. You walk by, you've seen it. Um, and in the bottom of the trough is where the screw conveyor is. Do you have the option to put those on part of the program where the we could cycle them? Well, certainly that, that option is always available, but it, um, it certainly would require some additional work in exactly what I don't know. No, we really want people near those things anyway. You know, periodically to listen to them and all that. And that's that one. When we go buy them, that's when we'll hit them. On top of it, you don't want money constantly because you won't hold up. No, I know that part. Okay. Well, these are yeah. these are electric operators. They're, they're not pneumatic. Um, we have found that the pneumatic uh, operators, uh, impactors, uh, vibrators, whatever you want to call them, they have a tendency to uh, bust up 3 16 plate, which is what the hopper is constructed of. And I've seen parent metal cracked. I mean, you know, somebody cranks it up to 100 pounds and then just turns the damn thing on and just rattles the hell out of it and ruins it. Um, we've come up with ideas on uh, the use of single impactors, which means when the thing gets a, an electrical signal to hit, it hits it once. And then you put a timer on it that it does that every 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever you want it to be. That, I think, works a lot better. In this particular case, they are electric vibrators. They are adjustable intensity-wise. And I don't know how the scale works on that. I think it works zero to 100 percent. We set them at 50 percent. Now the next question you ask is, if you get a, a stuck conveyor and you start vibrating these things automatically, you pack all the debris down your conveyor so that it don't want to turn. Because you're you more harm than good, right. and, and you certainly don't want that. It's one reason why they didn't want it on automatic. Okay, the the bag house is um, it's got uh, an inlet plenum and an outlet plenum. Um, and then from the plenums, it's got stubs that connect to the baghouse module itself. In each of these stubs, on the clean air side, as well as on the dirty air side, there are dampers. On the clean air side, there are electrically operated dampers. On the dirty air side, they are chain wheel operated dampers. The purpose of the outlet dampers is to take the compartment offline for offline cleaning that mode is selected, or for closing uh, for maintenance purposes. Of course, uh, in addition to closing the outlet damper for maintenance, you must also close the inlet damper, the chain operated damper. With both of those dampers closed, you can then enter the compartment um, and, and do maintenance if you need to. I talked about the bags uh, and, and, and all of that. Uh, a little bit more about the bags. Uh, they weigh 16 ounces per square yard. The cloth is treated with a silicone finish and it is also singed, which I didn't have that in here, but I found this out on Friday. Uh, in addition to the silicone finish, it is singed. And singed means that the material is run through a hot calendar, a roll, hot roll, and it's the, the hairs are, are um, heated and they melt. The purpose of both finishes is to make it slick and smooth so that when the dust is collected on there and it is pulsed, it releases. I have to be honest with you, I've never run into a combination of both singed and siliconized finish. I can either do one or the other. I've never seen both done. Whether more is better remains to be seen. I, there, there's always the concern about the inability to, to maintain a filter cake on the bags. And it is the dirt that's collected on the bags that helps filter the incoming dirt. That is more true on a woven cloth than it is on a felted cloth. This is felted, which is referred to as an in-depth filter. So it's a combination of the cloth itself as well as the dirt that's on the cloth that actually filters the oncoming dirt. We will see what uh, what happens with this uh, bag finish and uh, how it uh, how it uh, holds up and releases and so on. The question though, the siliconized finish. If we wash the bags, we have to reapply the finish. Necessary. Take it and wash it off. This would be dry cleaner. 
Well, I would, I would suspect that's true, although I couldn't attest to it. I, I really don't know for sure. <coughs> it, it would make sense to me that if not the first washing, uh, certainly down the road, you're going to lose it. And I'm, I'm sure the first washing, you're going to lose some of it. I don't know how much. You know, whether you lose half of it or all of it, I don't really don't know. Why, why was, uh, why was it uh, decided that the cars would be both silk and I've been cinched? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether it was our selection or whether it was specified. Uh, since I don't know, I can't, can't respond. I can check that out and find that out. Maybe, maybe the, um, the fact that it is singed and the silicon finish is lost after a cleaning, uh, a washing or laundering, um, still leaves you with the singed finish, so maybe you have the best of both worlds. I'm not sure. The allowable operating temperature for these bags is 275 degrees. The protection for that is the fact that there's a tempering air damper ahead of the bag house, and we have a controller that is set presently for 250 degrees, and there's a thermocouple in the ductwork, so should the thermocouple see 250, the tempering air damper opens up and protects the bag house bags against the elevated temperature. The second set point on that controller is 240 degrees, so when the gas air cools down to 240, the damper goes closed, and you pull off the shed rather than pull ambient air in through the tempering air damper. That range can be changed, it's all adjustable, Tighten it up, spread it out, change the numbers, anything that we think uh, works better. Um, the initial setting at 250 was to um, not see the 275 and build a little cushion in there. There's a, uh, a page here on the uh, theory of operation on filter bag cleaning, and I won't read all this, but it, it's uh, Pretty simple. Whenever um, you decide that you need to clean these bags, either by a manual mode, a timer mode, or a differential pressure mode, the timer mode and the differential pressure are automatic, um, a <clears throat> diaphragm valve opens up and lets compressed air to the tune of about three cubic feet of compressed air past the diaphragm valve and go down the header pipe and uh, exit the holes in the header pipe <laughs> over a bag. And there's 15 holes over the 15 bags. Whenever this is done, in our setup, we do two rows simultaneously. These two rows are not adjacent to each other, but it is two rows. This occurs in 50 milliseconds, so it's a bang, it's like a shot. Whenever this pulse of air comes out of the header, out of the hole that's in the header, it induces the air that's in the clean air chamber to go with it. And it goes with it down inside of a venturi section, which compresses this air and then expands it, and it forms what I like to refer to as a bubble of air. The bubble of air goes down the bag and expands the bag off of the cage that the bag is supported on. And when the bag expands off the cage and snaps back, the dust flies and drops into the hopper. Certainly it all doesn't come off. Some of it's going to go to other bags and get captured uh, in its uh, effort to get down into the hopper. But when it does come off, it comes off in spots, it comes off in in um, sheets, if you will, uh, or lumps, and that is typically enough to get the material to fall down into the hopper, which is where you want it. What, what determines the ability of the bags to clean in that fashion is referred to as the can velocity. And that's when the gas comes in, it goes, hits the baffle plate, goes down around the bags, it comes up around the bags, it's rising at a certain velocity, and again, it's called a can velocity. We think we know what number not to exceed. 
in terms of can velocity so that this thing will clean while it's filtering. If it doesn't, the backup of taking it offline, shut the flow of gas off, pulse it in, in that condition, does exist. <clears throat> if it doesn't clean because of a higher velocity, because the volume is higher than design, or if it doesn't clean because of the nature of the dust, it's a tenacious dust, a sticky dust, um, then you have the option of going to the offline clean after you've done all the other things that uh, are available to you, such as increase the frequency of cleaning, increase the air pressure in which you clean with, um, and even possibly um, uh, making some other hardware changes that um, might result in more effective cleaning. Although um, this particular piece of equipment, I think, has all of our latest designs and. Uh, some of those are the diaphragm valve that, uh, that permits the air to pass through the valve uh, is a double diaphragm valve instead of a single for energy. The header pipe is, the holes in the header pipe vary in size from front to back uh, rather than a standard size, which the name of the game there is to get the same pressure to each bag. Um, so that, that has the latest features, if you will. Also, the, we just redesigned the Venturi section, and the changes that were made to the Venturi are very slight. You couldn't see them with the naked eye. Uh, you have to take a set of calibers to the damn thing to, uh, to uh, determine the differences between the old and the new, and I'm not sure which this has, but we've tried to refine that Venturi. So if this has the old Venturi and there's a problem, certainly the newer Venturi may be just enough to get it over the ragged edge if it needs that. So there are some things that you can do before you need to go to the offline cleaning mode. But if you can't get it online, you can certainly have the offline available. This whole cleaning cycle is controlled by a programmable controller and it's initiated by differential pressure. We have a set point of six inches, and when it reaches six inches, two rows of bags in each module will pulse, all simultaneously. If it satisfies that pressure switch, it will shut it all down and wait till it reaches that set point again. If it didn't satisfy that pressure switch, it will pulse in about seven and a half seconds, two rows in each module again, and that will probably not be simultaneous. And the reason for that is each module's got a timer board. Each one is set at the minimum, which is about seven and a half seconds, but the accuracy of that timer is not that great, and therefore they will end up being a little out of sync. But the name of the game is to pulse two rows of bags in each of the eight modules and maintain that pressure drop set point as close to the set point as you can. What we try to do is get it to stay at the six inches and when it cleans two rows in each module and if it drops it down three or four tenths, that's within the range we want to hold. If it does that, the fan damper isn't going to start searching for a new set point or if it does, it's not going to move very far. One of the things that controls the, the fan damper, or the thing that controls the fan damper, is the flow element that's in the ductwork. As the flow element sees a change in flow, it adjusts the fan damper to maintain the design flow. So as the pressure drop goes up, the flow goes down, fan damper opens up trying to get that flow back and it will do that. If the bag house cleans and the pressure drop drops drastically, then the flow is going to go up and the fan damper is going to sit there and adjust again. But we don't want these drastic changes. We want them to be small uh, changes. We, we would like them not to be very fast changes and we will strive for that. Whether we achieve it, it remains to be seen. All of the timer settings for the operation of Baghouse are addressable 
And we have a listing here of the addresses. And when we go down to the control room, I'll certainly show anyone who wants to know how to address it and what the addresses are and how you make changes to it. It's not complicated. It's just a matter of being shown once and then and you have it. This page talks about online cleaning, offline cleaning, Delta P initiation, which we just talked about. Certainly, again, the offline cleaning is a, um, a function of closing the outlet damper, which is electric operated, and uh, pulsing the system uh, without flow. Again, when that occurs, if we need to go to that offline cleaning, when that occurs, then the pressure drop in the system is going to change, the flow will change, the flow element will sense that, it'll tell the fan dampers to open up, and then when the one module that's cleaning comes back into service, it changes all again. So we want to try to avoid the offline cleaning if possible. The other and probably a more important reason for avoiding the offline cleaning is if you take a compartment offline and clean the whole compartment, and the capability is there to clean either two rows in that compartment, all of the rows in that compartment, all of the rows in that compartment, two or three times. But the longer you keep it off, the higher that air to cloth ratio is on the others for a longer period of time. Flexibility is there to do all of those things, but if you take it offline, Generally speaking, you want to clean the whole compartment before you put it back online. If you clean the whole compartment and put it back online and you've overcleaned that compartment, that particular compartment then is going to want to hog more flow than the others. When that occurs, you could end up with bag damage because now since it's hogging more flow, its air to cloth ratio is considerably higher and you have a tendency of impregnating the cloth with the particulate. And sometimes when that material, when that particulate, the dirt, the dust, gets impregnated into the cloth, you can't get it out. And when it gets to the point where the cloth will no longer filter uh, its fair share of the volume at a reasonable pressure drop, then the bags are on the road to becoming blinded. Blinded is a kind of nasty word in our business but it's a fact of life. If the damn pores of the cloth get plugged up, the bag is blinded. You can tell this by two methods. One method is to clean the bag in the field, in the module, making adjustments to various things such as pulse pressure, frequency, um, and monitor its recovery, if it recovers. If it doesn't recover, then uh, and you beat it with all that you have to beat it with, then it's pretty much dead in the water. The other way is to take that bag, put it in a laboratory, and do a test on it, and measure it against um, experience. Bags are measured, the permeability of a bag is measured under new clean conditions. It doesn't stay that way, it gets dirty. The permeability of these bags is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 cubic feet of air uh, at a half inch pressure drop, brand new. Well, that volume uh, at the same pressure drop comes down once they get dirty, and then what you want it to do is level out. When it gets down in the range of one or two cubic feet of air versus the new of 30, and not at the level of four or five or six, and it's down into one or two, then it's pretty much dead in the water. It can be, you can recover from this by laundering, back, uh, by vacuuming, um, by air lancing. We talked a little bit about that last week, and uh, I do, I didn't think of it last week, but I do recall people going in and air lancing bags um, to recover it, to recover the, uh, the capability of the cloth. Uh, the problem with that is that's obviously treating the symptom rather than going back and determining the cause and, and getting to the root uh, of the problem and addressing that. Uh, we don't know if we're going to have a problem. We certainly, uh, if we have, we'll use all the tricks that are available to us and all the, all the knowledge and capabilities that are available to us. 
um, and, and see what happens. But <clears throat> hopefully, if we've done our job, um, which is design a good tight system and supply good quality materials, um, and we avoid the, the disastrous uh, conditions that I know will probably occur coming off the battery, or dilute the conditions that are coming off the battery enough that they don't present a problem to the bags themselves, then maybe this thing is going to turn out to be a success. Only time will tell. In addition to the differential pressure initiation of the cleaning cycle, we have a selector switch. You can put this thing in time cleaning. And as soon as you put it into time, it starts the timers and it will clean in the, in the sequence that, are, that were established by the timer settings forever. The disadvantage to time cleaning is, of course, uh, when it doesn't need to clean, it will, of course, still be cleaning. Cleaning is what wears out bags. If you don't clean them, they'll last a lot longer. So differential pressure initiation, we feel, is the preferred in terms of maintaining a pressure drop and also cleaning only when it's required. We also have a manual cleaning mode. The purpose of the manual cleaning mode is a troubleshooting mode. Oops. You can select the manual. You can select a given compartment. You can put it into offline, and you can push a button, and it will close that damper of that module. It will pulse those bags in that module and put that module back into service when you're finished. Um, you must put this selector switch back in time or back in delta P, or it'll just sit there and do nothing. So the purpose of the manual cleaning is a troubleshooting mode to check things, uh, find out if you can uh, recover from a, a, an awkward situation, a bad situation, um, and, and again, it's a troubleshooting e uh, effort. This is a listing of all the lights that are on the panel, and there's quite a number of them, page and a half, and then there's a listing of all the switches that are on the panel, and rather than go over these and just rattle them all off, when we get down to the panel, you'll be able to see them, and they'll be pretty much self-explanatory. They're all tagged. We also have an annunciator, and there are numerous points on the annunciator that um, describe a, an alarm state. There's also some shutdown conditions. The thing about the annunciator that you folks need to know about is the fact that when an alarm comes up, over on the other side of the battery, and the, whatever the equipment over there is called, pusher car or whatever, uh, ram, whatever it's called, there pusher, is a, machine. pusher machine, okay. there is a, an indication that there is a, an alarm. And it's a, just a, a light that says, hey, there's an alarm. You don't know what it is, so someone must go over to the uh, bag house control room, see what the alarm is, acknowledge that alarm, and then they can have, they have the ability to clear that alarm. Now, even though they didn't solve the problem, they've cleared the alarm. The purpose of that is to clear the alarm back at the pusher machine. Because you want to be prepared to get the second alarm should a second alarm come in. So just by clearing the alarm didn't make the problem go away. All it did was clear the alarm. You need to address the problem. And you which alarm came in. If you clear this alarm and get, take a case of uh, needing to go do something else, but then you want to come back to it and find out uh, you forgot which alarm it was, you didn't write it down, uh, there's two, two fans, you couldn't remember whether it was fan one or fan two, although only one is running at a time. Uh, whatever the circumstances are, by holding in the clear alarm button, for five seconds, the alarms will reappear. So you can look and see what alarms were there. A nice little feature. Okay? If the alarm went away, let's say it was a high delta P, and you acknowledge that alarm, you ran outside to do something, you come back in, you held in the button for five seconds, and um, nothing came up, well, that alarm cleared itself. So you don't have to worry about it. I do have a question. Shoot. You are? 
alarm comes on, the enunciator panel. Standard enunciator panel, the alarm comes on, you hit the reset or the silence button, acknowledge, right? acknowledge, whatever you want to call it. Right? The light stays on steady, right? Okay, instead of being flashing, right? We have this one different. This one, the light actually goes out. Or we got to wait a yep. It does three things. It flashes when it comes on. Right. It goes steady when you acknowledge. Right. And it goes out when you clear it. And it'll stay clear until the alarm disappears and then comes back again. <coughs> or you hold the button for five seconds to have it come back up. Okay. But you have to, it must clear, which is a bad feature. Normally we acknowledge around here. That's it. It's lit. Come back. It's still there. It's still there. Come back. It's not there. It's gone. But you don't have to clear. Well, the disadvantage to that, and, and, and it's my understanding we were told to, to supply it this fashion, is if you get a alarm, you acknowledge that alarm, there's still an alarm, and you don't clear it, there's still an alarm light over the pusher car. If a second alarm comes in, nobody knows it. The pusher car. Because he says, I've had an alarm. I've always had this alarm. I've had it for two hours. And I don't know that I have seven other alarms. I just have an alarm. So by clearing it, it permits a second, third alarm, fourth alarm, whatever, each time you clear. So we've had it here on our alarm panels where we acknowledge the blinker goes solid, light stays on, and the panel is still receptive to further alarms without anybody hitting it. Oh, our panel is. It's the pusher car light. It's not. What you're telling me, though, is that the panel, when you hit that clear button, the panel, the panel goes blank. As if it, it, the problem is correct. The alarm panel goes blank as if the problem is correct. And the pusher car light goes off. Right. Joe's really wanting, and I know why he's saying what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I think I know what he did. Was dead. He would like the light to stay on the alarm panel. Not, and when, when it's flashing, you send the signal over to the pusher. And when it's not flashing, then you ignore it as far as the pusher is concerned. I understand what you're saying. And I don't think it's that possible to do it. I don't know. Easy. I don't know if it's possible or not. It's, again, my understanding that the intent was for someone to come over, address the alarm, determine what it is, write it down on a piece of paper, clear it, and then go address the alarm, be it a temperature, be it a pressure drop. And addressing it may mean just to stand there and uh, make sure that uh, everything is functioning and in two minutes it clears itself. Because if it's a high pressure drop um, alarm, um, well, in the case of a high pressure drop, <coughs> it won't clear itself. Uh, there's a reason for it. And maybe it's because the um, compressor blew a circuit breaker or something. So you, you determine the compressor isn't running, and by starting up the compressor, getting compressed air, the thing starts to clean, and the pressure drop comes down, and now the alarm has cleared itself. <coughs> but it, it really tells you that you, you need to find out what's going on. In the meantime, does that disable the pusher so that it can't push out? Is yeah. that reason or is it just... I, I don't know if the alarm at the pusher uh, disables it or not. I really don't know that. Once you clear it, it won't come back unless you call it again? Or it clears itself and then it comes back again. Yes, John. You know, if it's a high differential and you clear it and you start up a compressor or turn a valve on or whatever, somebody screw the, shut something off, and you, uh, this thing starts to clean and, and satisfies that high differential pressure, as an example. Um, and then somebody does something else and you get it again, you know, obviously it'll come back. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't seem to be as necessary to put the extra steps in there. This is a normal, uh, audible, light, whatever you get with an alarm condition. Uh, what you're saying is you want the pusher car alarm light to go out when you change it from a flashing state to a steady state. Right. I don't know if it's feasible, but I'll find out. You know, if it comes off the light bulb, the light's on, right? It's feasible. If we have audibles right now off the wires where the light, say, even a remote light will stay lit, crystallized uh, marley. The horn is shut down. The horn 
is then uh, the second alarm condition occurs, the horn will go off. Pardon me, I'm going to change. Okay, the horn, it's just a matter of relay, holding a relay, and what they do is. It's a matter of using the horn relay to issue the circuit over to the pusher. When the horn is activated, when you tell the PC that you should set a signal on the radio, when the horn is not activated, it doesn't send a signal. That's how you find it. Now we don't get a fair button. Somebody pulls the horn relay, and of course we're they can always jerry-rig anything that doesn't work. That's very true. Okay, in addition, we've got uh, two chart recorders, circular chart recorders with 24-hour charts. Um, each has got two channels. In one chart recorder, we've got the baghouse differential pressure being displayed as well as recorded. And then it flashes over to channel two, which has got the baghouse inlet temperature, which is also displayed as well as being recorded. There's two pins. So you can walk in there and at a glance you can see what the temperature coming into the baghouse is as well as what the differential pressure is. In addition, we've got individual compartment manometers and you can see what the differential pressure across each compartment is. And the average of those compartments, along with a little mechanical loss, would equal the overall differential pressure. So they're not going to all read exactly the same. In addition to the baghouse inlet temperature being displayed and recorded on the recorder, there is another controller for the tempering air damper that has a separate thermocouple. And that controller also has a, an LED readout so that you can see what the temperature is at that thermocouple. The difference in those two thermocouples physically is 40-50 uh, feet of duct work. Um, one, the one for the recorder is after the tempering air damper. The one for the tempering air damper is ahead of the tempering air damper. And as long as the tempering air damper isn't open, they're going to read very close to each other. The other chart recorder has two channels, two pens, and the first one is for displaying and recording the flow to the baghouse, which comes off the flow <coughs> instrument that's installed in the ductwork. The reading that you get has to be multiplied by 10, and that's just because there aren't enough characters available to us. <coughs> so if it's sitting there reading 45,000, it's really 450,000. The second channel is used to display and record the compressor, compressed air pressure. And we have that, those compressors set up to uh, cut out at 124 pounds and come on at about 95, I believe, 95 or 100. It's, there's two compressors and they're not exactly the same, but they're within a couple of pounds of each other. So you can certainly walk in and see where the, um, what's indicated and what's re being recorded uh, relative to compressor pressure. And obviously if you've got a high delta P and you look at the chart and you find out that the pen indicated a decline in, in compressed air pressure, then you know you lost the compressor. So it's, it's a great trouble, troubleshooting tool. Back to the annunciator, there are a whole slew of uh, points up there, uh, bearing high temperature and vibration and motor overload and uh, high bearing shutdown and high motor temperature, and just a whole raft of them. Of course, that's typical for young fans. Um, baghouse high inlet temperature, high delta P. Uh, <coughs> We also have located in each of the eight modules a thermocouple and a readout back at the panel for measuring the temperature inside the module. And certainly they're going to all run, if everything's normal, about the same temperature. Um, I think the intent here was that the, if there's a fire in any given module, it certainly would register a high temperature. There's also a fire probe 
in the ductwork ahead of the bag house and one of the annunciator points is a fire alarm. Um, what is that set for? Uh, is there some, it has to be a temperature to initiate that thing. Fire points? Yeah. Do you know what it is? We didn't. We didn't. There was no settings on that. Okay, well, <clears throat> it probably isn't. Um, it probably is a uh, just a fusible link that comes in in a given range. Uh, and, and I honestly don't know what it is right at the moment. <coughs> but whatever it is, uh, should a elevated temperature fire uh, be present, uh, we'll get the alarm back at the panel. If there's a fire in the ductwork somewhere that uh, sets off that alarm. And if it's a fusible link, that means we've got to go out there and well, I replace say, it. Uh, I say fusible link. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but uh, it could be. Could be. Now, all the all the details of all these components are in the big book, and uh, certainly that that has to be. Uh, known by someone who has to pay attention to that. And it just tells me that there's a fire detector. It doesn't tell me anything about it. And then what? And then what? <laughs> Bring the bags up. <clears throat> Obviously, if there's a fire, and I think um, what we can all envision is we've got this gooey tar all on the inside of this ductwork that uh, catches fire and is, uh, it's oil so it's flaming up and um, um, I don't know, you tell me, what do you put an oil and fire out with? Certainly not water, right? You're saying, you're getting back to your compressors, you're saying both of the compressors are going to be online at the same time? No, sir. Or one just the back up? <clears throat> yes and no. The way the compressors work is you can select number one or number two, okay. and you can run it. You can put the selector switch in automatic, and number one will run, charge the system up. When the system pressure drops off, number two will run, charge the system up. When it drops off, number one will sit there and alternate back and forth if you're in the automatic mode. If you want to run just one of them until it dies, then you just select that one and let it rip. The same thing is true with the pre-coat blowers for the pre-coat, which we probably are not going to use initially, but the same control is true. In the automatic mode, blower number one will uh, be operating, and should you shut blower number one down and restart, blower number two will restart. It's only when you shut them down. The mode of operation for those blowers is to run continuously. It's only when you shut one down and restart will the other one start up, unless you select the given one. Right now, we, if we were to run it, we'd have to select number two because number one is a bad coupling that needs to be replaced. Could the pre system be used for putting the diatomaceous earth in place? The, the initial diatomaceous earth? It could be, but if you put the pre-coat material, the diatomaceous earth material, in through the pre-coat system, we do have the ability to, to put it into each compartment of each module, uh, compartment uh, hopper of each module. Um, the answer to your question is yes, it could be. The problem with it is we would have to sit down and calculate if we put all 88 bags into the silo how long we need to operate the rotary valve for each given compartment, and that can be done. The problem is, how do you get all the bags into the, into the silo? It's just as easy to dump the bags into the hopper of the compartments by opening up the door and starting up the fan and feeding the material in to the hopper and get it airborne and get it up on the floor. Yeah, that would be simpler to hoist it up on top and dump it in and then uh, check out the pre system. No, early on. Well, whatever. It's no. easy the last eight, last bag you put in for the last hopper you put in the pre coat. Mm -hmm. Then you dump it all into the one hopper and you know it's all got to go there anyways. Well, 
typically, Joe, you raised a very good point, and you know, typically bag house is already equipped with a, a pre-code system or an injection system, and, and it just never entered my mind to do it in that fashion. Um, the, the other thing about putting the bags into the hoppers is I know that we put 11 bags in each hopper and I watch the material go up and get on the bags. If we do it through the system that's all closed up, you assume that the material went into the hopper and got up on the bags and didn't fall down into the hopper and, and not get to where you want it. So I feel a little more comfortable being able to watch it. I've watched it many times and um, I think there's a, a, just a comfort factor there. Back to the fire alarm, there's nothing further. What is tied in to the system? Is that that's an alarm? Is that all it is? That's, that's uh, correct. Down condition. Um, I think it's uh, strictly an alarm. Yeah, it just says baghouse fire alarm. Okay, so if we want anything other than that, we have to <coughs> think at it. Say so. okay. Just to, to, to finish out these alarms, there's an air compressor failure uh, <coughs> alarm that comes in, and um, there's compressed air low pressure alarm. There's conveying system failure, which are all the screw conveyors, rotary valves. And then there's eight spares. This uh, panel, panel. That, <laughs> that is pretty much the you know the overview of what this con this equipment consists of in in, a, in an overview fashion. Now, certainly, as we all know, it's made up of all these components, and as I said earlier, the details <coughs> on at least most of the components are in the big book. If you, if you want to know what weight of oil, and, and Al and I went down this road uh, a month or so ago, if you want to know what weight of oil is used in the screw conveyor gearbox, it's in the book. I don't know off, off the top of my head, no, but it's in the book. And we found it, and that's what's in there. Same thing's true with the rotary valve uh, gearbox um, as, as an example. We talked about pre-coating with diatomaceous earth, and last week I said that on the back of these little sweet low things, it, it tells you that that's what's in there. And what it really says, the guy from John Manville told me that diatomaceous earth is in here. And what it says on the back is um, calcium sulfate, an anti-caking agent. I can hardly read that with my mind. So diatomaceous earth and calcium sulfate basically the same thing, I guess. Um, the pre-coating is with the diatomaceous earth. It prevents caking in here. It also prevents caking in the bag house. They tell me that it will absorb uh, 300 times its own weight um, with moisture. And I've used it on numerous occasions and have been actually very surprised knowing that we were generating moisture within the system because of a uh, cooling down uh, on a coal-fired boiler or a garbage incinerator and it's starting back up and then heating back up and going through the dew point knowing that we were making water in the system I did not see any effects of that water on the bags at all um, we saw one job recently, we saw the effects of the water on the clean air side of the bag house in terms of rust. The thing was rusting away. Obviously, there had to be water there for that to be created. But on the dirty air side, where the walls are protected by the dirt and the bags are protected by the diatomaceous earth pre coat, we saw no damages at all. So I'm pretty high on it as a, as a pre coat material and as an absorber of moisture. I think with that, I, unless there's more questions, uh, we can go down and start looking at this equipment. Are there any bag houses with CO2 systems on? 
I'm sure there are, are quite a number of them. Um, I don't believe that we've ever supplied any, although probably because we would um, we would ask someone to not put that in our scope of work. What we would provide for them would be an attachment, a coupling, a fitting in the roof, in the wall, in the hopper for a system of any sort. We've done it with um, with water. People have asked us to put uh, fittings in to accommodate the uh, water. And uh, this job I was just talking about, uh, California, two jobs in California, they've got um, sensors in the ductwork, in the bag house, uh, in the hopper area, in the clean air area, and they've got water piped into this thing in uh, many areas. And it was, a, it was a requirement of the local uh, fire authorities to have that. And what's really amazing is this, these bag houses were on a fluidized bed boiler burning um, grapevines and peach pits and agricultural biomass, it's called. And the fact that it's a fluidized bed boiler with a sand bed, the bulk of the material collected in the bag house is sand. And the ash that's collected, the fly ash from the burning of this biomass, uh, is completely consumed, so there is no carbon, at least the, uh, the samples that I looked at. Uh, certainly nothing combustible in the sand, and the chances of it ever being used is uh, pretty remote, but it's there. Different situation here. We know we're going to have combustible material in there, and uh, it's, it's obviously a little scary, I think. Just another little point, I got a phone call on Friday from a customer in Arkansas saying that they had a fire and upon um, investigating it, uh, they saw the side of the hopper was uh, hot and um, it was, uh, paint was blistering off. So they shut the fan off and they closed the inlet damper, closed the outlet damper, and bottled up this bag house. It's only a two compartment bag house, two module bag house. And they let it sit there for an hour. And they went back to investigate. And someone opened up the door and a ball of fire came out of the door. Two guys were badly burned. One man, 98% of his body. The other one, 40% of his body. And it's not good to hear those kind of stories, and they were concerned about the one man not making it. Um, we're equally concerned, but to be honest with you, uh, that's out of our area of expertise, and I don't really know what you do about it in each and every case. It depends upon what the process is, how you address any kind of a fire situation. If the material isn't in there, then you have a better chance of not having a fire. And that's why we talk about evacuating the material out of there as quickly as it gets in there. But what coats the walls of the ductwork um, doesn't come out. So if, you, if the combustible material is on the walls, and we know there's plenty of oxygen because we're sucking in the world out here, all we need is something to ignite it, and it's a fire. And there is something to ignite it. That coke comes out of it, it's red hot. All you do is get some sparks up in there, and it, it can be a problem. Um, many guys have been to Shenango, and they've not had that problem. Other coke batteries, uh, to my knowledge, have not had that problem. I guess it's um, roll the dice, take your chances. More questions? I think one of the things that um, if you don't have them, you know, our customer is McGraw Construction and we issued some number of these books to them. So if you don't have it, you need to get it. How many volumes you said? I don't know exactly how many we issued to them. Uh, how many volumes? Is oh, this is, this is it. This is the whole thing. Yeah, that's the whole thing. I have. We did send some of those up there, up there, but there's two boxes 
of stuff yet to come. But you're just saying one of nine volumes. I was in the beginning. Teasing. I wasn't sure if you were just kidding or at all. I was teasing. Because I don't have nine volumes. Nah. Well, the only thing we found in our looking through something that thing was that a lot of the parcels were Basically, like there's two books. One's O&M and one's Installation and Erection. So they're both saying, about that thing. I said, when I looked through that parcel list and Paul was looking through a lot of that stuff wasn't uh, legible because there were so many copies made. Okay, we made 10, ten books. Ten identical right. books, okay? As far as parts and some of those. And I think you said if you change the belt sizes on the screws, I, I, but they're all the same, I remember. Right? So because I had to extend them over someplace. We changed the belt sizes on the gather screws because we rotated the, okay. the gearbox and motor 90 degrees so there would not be an interference. I've recorded that in here in red pencil. I don't think it's the same as the other ones. I, I'm not sure of that. Yeah. Well, we're going to revise all that and, and issue that you know, revised drawing with those new numbers on them. But you know, let's face it, now that, that drawing may never get in your hand, so you better have written it down somewhere. And then, of course, you can always look on the broken belt. But you're going to have spares, right? You mean they don't come with the bag I'll give you the old ones. <laughs> <laughs> They're three inches too long. <laughs> yeah, I've got them. One of the other things, uh, Dan, you, you talked about uh, wanting to get maybe some specific questions answered answered about the PLC. I, I'm really not in a position to answer any specific questions about it. Um, but I can, we met Rick Pepper, he was here. And you can certainly get on the phone and call Rick and talk to him. Uh, a couple things I know about it. One is, we've got a processor board in there that is RAM memory that will be pulled out and EEPROM memory will be installed once we burn a couple of chips. We didn't want to do that until we were satisfied with everything functioning correctly. And we, we run most of the stuff, but we want to give a little bit of a chance. Um, plus, Ricky's having trouble figuring out how to burn this damn thing, but he'll, he'll get that zeroed in, right? And the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a, an access module that we can uh, punch up all the addresses to all the timers and, uh, and those can be changed. In addition, you can punch up the address of a given timer and then you can back off one digit of that address for the address. For example, uh, timer address 2011, you can punch up 2010 and you can actually watch it then count whatever that's worth. There are a lot of timers on this job, so we certainly can't watch them all, but um, maybe we figure out which one is the key and leave it in there so that you walk in the control room and uh, I'm thinking the one would be the module clean timer. You walk in the control room and you see, up oh, it went into a cleaning cycle. You look down, you watch it go through its timer. Maybe that's the key one that you want. Build the charts. Yes. Yes. Charts are going to develop charts a pattern. Do it. Yeah. You're going to develop a pattern. You certainly have to get familiar with the pattern. And then when it deviates from the panel, um, the yellow is designated <coughs> for fan one, the blue is done into uh, red for the bag house and free coat, green for some auxiliaries. As you can see, we've got compressed air, low pressure, and here we've got compressed air pressure channel 2 at 66 pounds and we have an alarm which is why we have that alarm we have that because the compressor for some reason are probably shut down the, we get up to 124 that would go out that would go out which which one is fan 1 and fan 2 fan 1 is on the east side battery side. Fan 2 is on the west side, lake side. Okay. Fan 2 is the one that will be hopefully capable of running first thing in the morning or maybe even later today. This chart recorder as we talked about is for 
Nighthouse Inlet Temperature, and Nighthouse Delta P. The, the alarms off of this recorder go into this annunciator, as well as the alarm or set point of six inches to initiate a cleaning cycle of the bag house. This little device here is for the tempering air damper control. Thermocouple is telling us 84 degrees in the duct. At 250 degrees, 249 degrees, the tempering air damper would go open. At 240, it would go not closed. It's easily adjustable. Oh, no, I can see now we've got to buy a lot of screwdrivers. This is <laughs> oh, no. If you're nice, I might even give no, you. No, 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 no. I try to throw them away when them guys get them. <laughs> um, better off. If we lower this to ambient, we've got the alarm, and I heard the damper go open out there. So this gives you that alarm. <laughs> Nothing here for it. This damper is now open, as indicated by this green light. Okay, is that working outside? It's working out. Right, it's open all the way. That's open all the way. Now it went closed. It's closed now. Yeah, it's full. Okay, as indicated by the light, and we're above above the 83 degrees. Put it back to 250. I hope when you get the fire alarm that tempering air damper doesn't try to open. And then you'll feed the fire if there is one. Yeah. If the fire creates a temperature of 250, the damper's going to go open. You don't want that going <coughs> to the bag house, that's for sure. Why do you want to pick the bag? So Besides that, that'll ventilate, that'll put fresh air into your bag house and will cut your draft out that's going in from the... Yeah, whether it comes in through the tempering air damper or comes in through the shed, air is air, right? It's going to, it's going to get you no matter what. Okay, as we talked about, if you've got uh, flashing alarms and you acknowledge the ones that are in effect go solid, and if you clear them, they go out. We have a real interface there with uh, the fan. Pull that button in for five seconds, they come back. They come back in a flashing mode. You acknowledge and they go solid. These two are lit because we have normally open instead of normally closed contacts, or vice versa. When we hook up the uh, workstation to the PLC, we'll change those contacts and take care of those. This will go out when the compressor is running, and this will go out when we run the screw conveyors. Uh, fan one, not operational. Fan two, there's a. This is caused by the. Uh, The, uh, load track. the load track, the an input from the load track giving us this and they're in the process of determining exactly what's going on and they obviously haven't fixed that yet. And this doesn't do anything except receive information and enunciate. They were trying to indicate that this was causing some other problems, but that's not the case. Your uh, tip back a little damp while you're, you're your damper outside it that regulates automatically as temperature increases. No. When it gets to 250, it goes open. All the way. All the way.